I, uh, I am a little lacking in sleep, which is fairly unusual for me on a Sunday morning because Ken and I just generally uh, kind of put a bubble wrap around Saturday and Saturday night. We try not to do anything Saturday night because we just want to be spiritually and physically and emotionally prepared for Sunday morning. Like that's just so important to us. So it's very rare for us to have an event uh, that we're going to do on Saturday night, but yesterday we did. And just to tell you how lacking in sleep I am, I got to church, and I'm going to read fairly a long passage today out of Matthew. I don't have my reading glasses, and so I don't know if Sarah's going to hold the Bible over there, and then maybe I can see it. Actually, I borrowed my sister's. And, and just to even tell you more how I am not totally operating with a full deck of cards, is there was literally next to me, like within touching distance, a box of Kleenex right over here, and I said, to Pearl, who was standing next to me, I need a Kleenex. And then I proceeded to move this stool out of the way, climb on the ground over, uh, way over there to grab a Kleenex. All the while she's watching me while this Kleenex box is right here. And she just finally said to me, is there something wrong with this Kleenex box? Or, and I'm like, I did not even see that Kleenex box. So at any rate, uh, Caleb and Nate are at Rangeview High School, and so are some of you. Nasir, I see you. Dylan, I see you, and different ones. And so for uh, those of you that don't know, Rangeview has a really good basketball team. And they were in the state championship last night. And so we had to go because Rangeview has not been in a state championship game or won a state championship game since I was a freshman in high school. And that was not that long ago, I realized. No, that was <laughs> since, uh, since 1984. They haven't won. And so we went to the game last night, and I said to my boys, I want you to know how big of a deal this is. My, 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 my football team has gone to the Super Bowl seven times. I have never been a part of a high school that's playing in a boys' basketball state championship ever. In fact, this was kind of crazy, but I, we, for some reason, we ended up, we're in this huge arena, and we are sitting by the principal of the high school. And, uh, and I said to him, is this amazing? This is like a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And he's like, I hope not. <laughs> That's what he said to me. <laughs> and then I was like, Southwest, want to get away. Um, but anyway, uh, the game started last night at 8.30, which on this time period is 9.30 at night. The game started. And uh, they won. Hallelujah, they won, which is awesome. And uh, they, were, they were amazing. They were amazing. And so anyway, we didn't get home until like 12.30 last night. Got to bed about 12.45, 1 o'clock in the morning. So when the alarm went off this morning at 4.50, it was a shock. Therefore, I did not see the box of clinics, and so if I seem a little off this morning, you know why. But let me start this morning by telling you about uh, an experience that we had on the ship. We didn't get to this last week. Last week, we shared with you about our cruise and just different things that happened to us. We went on a cruise with Family Life Today, that ministry. They rented the whole boat, and last week, Ken and I just shared about things that happened and how it, it, it relates to our work with God, but we didn't get to one thing, and I just want to share that this morning, but as I related to you before, every night on the ship, we basically go to what amounts to a church service. They have a time of worship and then they have a sermon. Usually the sermon's about marriage, but not always. At any rate, on this particular evening, it was about halfway through uh, the cruise, so maybe we'll say on a Thursday night, I don't remember exactly, but the, the family life today always goes to different churches around the nation and, and ask the worship team, I wish they'd ask us, to come on the cruise for free, but then play for their services. So the church that was doing that this year was from Arizona, and they were excellent. They were outstanding. But in the middle of one of their worship sets, one of the singers began to sing a solo. She had an outstanding, beautiful, melodic voice. And she was singing a solo to What a Beautiful Name It Is. We know that song. And, but during this solo, something went terribly wrong. And you know, as a trained musician, I just picked it up that fast. But I saw this whole solo, this whole song imploding and it was the keyboard player's fault because he gave her such a poor introduction. I just heard it happening because I know I'm so familiar with the song. He gave her such a poor introduction that she started to sing in the wrong key. And so for the first stanza or two, it was awkward because he was playing in one key and she was singing in a different key. 
But as the song was building, as that song does, it was moving quickly from awful, from, from awkward to absolutely awful. And even though it was the keyboard player's fault, who's going to be embarrassed? The soloist. Who's going to be just like wanting to climb in a hole, you know, Southwest want to get away? She was in trouble. And just to give you a feel for this, there were about 700 people in that service. And what do you do? I mean, do you stop and start over? And, and, and remember, this was a guest band there by special invitation. This was a nightmare for them. And, and there were famous singers on board, like Meredith Andrews was on board. I don't know if she was in that service, but she was there. And Colton Dixon was there. And for me, it was this horrible drama unfolding, like what is going to happen as the song continues to build and the discord and the disharmony and the clashing are building too. But here's the thing that happened. There was a guy leader, and you could tell he was the leader of the band, and he played the guitar, and, and all the other singers had kind of stepped away from their mic, and she had stepped forward, implying, you know, I'm singing this solo. He just very subtly stepped forward to his mic, and very quietly, he began to sing in the right key. Not obtrusively, but so smoothly. And then you could tell her, you could tell that she began to to, to realize there was a problem and get the correct pitch. And as soon as she or her tones were correct, he just backed away. And it was done so smoothly and so unobtrusively that I bet most of the congregation didn't even realize that disaster had just been diverted. And for me as a musician, I was just so impressed with how that was handled. Because as musicians, we can put ourselves out there. You know, like if you're a drummer, like, let's say it this way. If you're a backup guitar and you hit a wrong note, probably nobody's going to know. But if you're a drummer or you're like lead keyboard or you're a soloist and you mess up, everybody knows. Like, you're putting yourself out there. It's, it can be hard to be a musician in a church type setting. So anyway, what I want you to see is that the guy leader didn't highlight that there was a problem. He did it so subtly. He didn't highlight himself. But he saved his teammate from embarrassment. He walked beside her when she needed help and then removed himself when she didn't. And I just thought, what an awesome example. You know, he didn't criticize her. Nothing in his, his facial expressions, you know what, 95% of communication is nonverbal. Nothing in his facial, we were on the front row, so we could see everything. Nothing revealed that he was frustrated or critical. To me, it was such a picture of someone coming alongside someone else who is sinking and offering support, but not in a critical way, not in a judgmental way, not in a harsh way, not in a self-promoting way, but with gentleness and compassion, offering assistance and then stepping away when the person is on stable ground again. Philippians 2 says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Don't merely look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. And so just a brief admonition this morning before we get started, look for ways to help other people. And, and I'm preaching to myself here, but don't be so preoccupied. I need to come on. Anybody else in life get busy? You get preoccupied with your stuff, right? That happens to me. But don't be so preoccupied that you don't see that this person over here needs help. Because that's what we're called to do. We're called to serve. If you think you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. Okay, that's funnier than, let's do that again. So leading up to that tweet, if you think you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. Come on, everybody. Thank you. I realize that first service loves this time change, second service not quite so much. <laughs> Forgiveness doesn't make the other person right. Forgiveness makes you free. Amen. I'm going to have to give you guys a shot of espresso here pretty soon. A mistake that makes you humble is better than an achievement that makes you arrogant. Yeah? Most women aren't looking for Superman, but for supper man. Someone who will cook dinner for the family. Amen? <laughs> that, I finally got a response. Yay. 
Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 26. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 26. If you don't have your Bibles, will you grab a pew Bible and turn to Matthew 26? Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And if you come from a more traditional church background, you are aware that this last Wednesday was Ash Wednesday and the beginning of Lent. And for many Christians all over the world, they are now celebrating a time of fasting and repentance and preparation for Easter, which is six weeks away. And I was thinking about that this week, and I felt like the Lord said to me, Amy, I want you to prepare yourself for Easter. And taking that from me to us, I want us as a church, God wants us as a church to prepare our hearts for Easter. And I begin to think, what, Lord, what does that look like? And what came to me is, how did Jesus prepare himself for Easter? Because he didn't just have to prepare himself for Resurrection Day. He had to prepare himself for the things that led to it. So think through the story with me. And I know we've all heard the Easter story so many times. But just try to step into the story. On Thursday, which has traditionally been called Monday Thursday, the Thursday of Easter week back in the first century, back in zero, on Monday Thursday, Jesus ate a meal with his disciples, and it has been since called the Last Supper. And as he sat there with his friends, his closest friends, as he looked around the room, around the table, at the talking and the, the jovial atmosphere that's going on and the friendship and the, the stories that are is being told. As he looks around the table, he knows that one of them is going to betray him that very night. But this is the thing. Jesus also knew that all of the disciples would abandon him. This is what it says. Tonight, Jesus said, this is Jesus talking, tonight, all of you, will desert me. After dinner, they walk to an olive grove called Gethsemane. And I think we can assume that Jesus and the disciples had walked this garden together many times. And the disciples, this is just another evening walk. They have no idea what's coming. They don't see this night as any different, but Jesus does. And the disciples are walking with Jesus, and you know, they are now well-fed. They've probably had a fair amount of wine, and they're tired. They're sleepy. They're ready for bed. And yet Jesus wants to go walk in the garden. They didn't know that tonight was different. They didn't know what was coming. But the Bible tells us that Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. I don't know if this is like, if you're like me in this, but... For a lot of us, sometimes the anticipation of a horrible event is worse than the event itself. The anticipation for Jesus had to be so hard. He was fully human. He had human emotions. And he was standing there waiting in the garden, waiting for what he knows is coming. Arrest. Abuse abandonment, humiliation, ridicule, shame. Jesus, who knew no sin, had never known shame before. Shame. And not just his. Not his at all, but ours. Everybody's shame. And then think about the torture that's coming, the hideous, undescribable torture and finally, death. He knows that G Jesus knows that he is called to carry the sins of the world on his body. And he knows that as such, God, his father, his daddy, his Abba, Abba, that the father for the first time in all of time will look the other way and forsake him and like everyone else, abandon him too. Jesus knows. 
And the scripture describes Jesus this way. He says he became anguished and distressed. And he told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. The Gospel of Luke tells us that Jesus' agony was so intense, so all-consuming, that he pleaded with God, Lord, if there's any other way, God, if, take this cup from me if there is any other means, any other method, any other plan. Take this from me, but not my will, your will be done. And then the next verse, it says, and being in agony, Jesus was in agony. He prayed more earnestly than his sweat. Look at this. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. He began to sweat blood. Think on that. The anxiety and the crushing, the anxiety and the agony is so crushing, he begins to sweat blood. And this condition actually has a name. It's called hematidrosis. And they've actually seen this happen in other people. It's very rare. But this has been seen and documented in men who are on death row as they walk to their execution. That's the intensity of the emotion that Jesus was feeling. He was like a man on death row walking to his execution. Except that the execution wasn't coming right away. He had much torture and abuse to face first. Abused, Isaiah tells us, to the point. Beaten and just torn apart to the point that his face became unrecognizable. Jesus knows what's coming. His physical body is reacting. But instead of fleeing the garden, he waits. He tells the disciples to keep watch, but they fall asleep. Don't they realize? Don't they care? Jesus is waiting, and then he hears a noise over on the other side of the garden, and his eyes go that way, and he sees a mob approaching, and they're coming, and they're getting bigger as they, as they come toward him, and they're all, he sees, holding swords and clubs, and they come into the garden where Jesus and his disciples are, and they infiltrate that garden, swarming in, surrounding Jesus and his disciples like a salivating pack of wolves, circling, ready to pounce on their prey. And the leader of the pack is the traitor himself, Judas. And he approaches Jesus and he gives the prearranged signal, you'll know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. And so he approaches Jesus and he gives him a kiss and he says, greetings, Rabbi. <sighs> like everything's okay. Like this is no big deal. So deceived, such pretense. And Jesus responds. Jesus doesn't respond in kind like, hey, it's great to see you. He knows what's coming. Jesus says, my friend, isn't that interesting? He calls him his friend. You know that every single one of us can call ourselves a friend to God? If Jesus can call Judas a friend, I'm a friend of God. My friend, he says, no pretense here. Go ahead and do what you've come for. Let's get this started. So they grab Jesus. And if the moment can't get more intense, and I want you to feel the tension that's there. If the moment can't get more intense, Peter, a ticking time bomb, pulls out his sword, and as I see it, he just swings it through the air. And he cuts off the high priest slave's ear. And I can only imagine with that happening, everybody pulls out their swords. This is a massacre ready to happen. This is a bomb that's going to explode. This could become a bloodbath easily. But Jesus stops that. Because instead of praising Peter for his loyalty and urging others to follow Peter's example, Jesus rebukes Peter. 
Jesus says, put away your sword. Don't you realize, Jesus says, that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us, and he would send them instantly. And then Jesus poses this question that I want you to see. To me, this next statement out of the book of Matthew is the pivotal statement of this whole story. It all rests on this. So I asked you to turn to Matthew. Turn to verse 54, and I want you to see this statement. And I just want to add this. If you have your Bible or you're using a pew Bible, within each pew holder, I have put pins. Would you grab a pin? And I'm, I'm encouraging you to underline this, this next statement. Matthew 26, verse 54. Jesus is saying, I could have asked my father for thousands of angels, but underline this, verse 54, but if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? If I rescued us and I rescued myself, how would the scriptures be fulfilled? And this is what I want you to see. I've wanted you to feel the intensity, the tension of the moment, the betrayal, the anguish that Jesus felt, the agony and the torment of his soul. And if there was ever a time in Jesus' life where he was to become self-absorbed, this was it. If there was ever a time in Jesus' life where he wanted to escape and return to the Father, it was right now. I mean, Jesus could, could walk on water, right? So he could just disappear. He did that in a crowd once. He just disappeared. If there was ever a time for Jesus to become self-absorbed, it was now. As he stared at the hateful mob that had come to arrest him, filled with treachery and rage. This is a pivotal moment. It's a climax of the crisis. But what I want you to see is that Jesus doesn't focus on himself. He says the scriptures must be fulfilled. Forget personal consequences. Forget personal protection. Forget the person. Focus on the bigger picture because eternity is at stake. Man's salvation is on the line. Redemption is the reason. The scriptures must be fulfilled. And so my question for you is, how was Jesus able to face the torture and the abuse that was coming and keep his focus on the bigger picture? How was Jesus able to say such an unselfish statement at, so, at a time of such intense personal crisis? when he felt such anguish that he was sweating drops of blood. How did Jesus prepare himself for this pivotal moment? Or I asked you the question at the beginning, how did Jesus prepare himself for Easter? And the scripture shows us, and I want to show you. And to do that, we have to back up in time. I realize you know, I'm a trained teacher. It's a little odd to tell the end of the story before the beginning. But I've done that on purpose because I want you to see what Jesus did to get to the point that we're at right now. And so we're going to look at what Jesus did earlier in Matthew 26. And quite honestly, I have read this passage countless times. I've probably read this passage four to five times a year because I just keep reading like a circle through the Gospels. I've probably read it four to five times a year for the last 30 years, maybe more than that. I have read this passage so many times, but I've never really seen this before. The Bible is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. You can read something and then suddenly God highlights it for you. That's what he did to me. And there's a word here that I want to zero on, zero in on, and I'm going to point it out to you. And it shows what Jesus did to prepare for this pivotal moment that led to Easter. So again, if you have your Bibles, I want you to read this with me. And as I read this, I'm going to point out the word to you. I urge you to underline it. We're going to see this word five times. And this week, I read this passage from New Living 
translation from New American Standard, from NIV, from ESV, from the Message, from the New King James, from the Amplified, and every single translation points out this word five times. Five times highlighting what Jesus did. How did he prepare himself for Easter? So read this with me. I'm again, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, Matthew 26, and I'm starting in verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. That's number one, pray, underline pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became dis anguished and distressed, and he told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And he went on a little further and bowed his face to the ground, praying. Number two, praying. My father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. And he said to Peter, couldn't you even watch with me one hour? Keep watch and pray, number three, so that you will not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, number four. My father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. He asked God the same thing again. If there's any other way. And when he returned to them again, he found them sleeping for they couldn't keep their eyes opening. So verse 44, he went to pray. Fifth time it's mentioned. A third time saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But look, the time has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. And even as Jesus said this to Judas, said this, even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. And they had been sent by the leading priests and the elders of the people. The traitor Judas had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi. And he exclaimed as he gave him the kiss. And Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you've come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest slaves, slashing off his ear. Put away your sword, Jesus told him. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us and he would send them instantly? But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? How did Jesus prepare himself for Easter? He prayed. He prayed. Not just once, but over and over again. And I wanna encourage us this Easter season to do the same thing. I wanna encourage us to work on our prayer lives. And God willing, I'm going to spend next week talking about prayer again. I want us to think and, and, and analyze our prayer lives. And, and just to begin this, this discussion on prayer, I want to take a quick survey. Will you just indulge me for a minute? I'm going to take a survey. And if I ask you a survey question, will you be honest? And you're going to think, well, it depends on what the question is, right? But here's the question. I'm going to be honest. I encourage you to be honest. Here's the question. Please raise your hand if you feel this way. How many of you feel like you should pray more? Look around. It's almost all of us. It's almost all of us. See, the truth is this is something that most of us struggle with. If you thought it was just you, look at the survey results. And you know, there are a variety of reasons we don't pray more. We can get lazy. Let's just keep it real, right? Let's keep it real. We can get lazy. We can get discouraged. We can get disillusioned. Or we can feel like we don't really know how to pray or we're not that good at it. Like, I can't pray like Jorge. Look at the way he prays. I'm never going to be like that. We can start comparing ourselves to other people. I'm not seeing the results they're seeing. In fact, I, I've prayed about this for years and I don't see results. Why do I keep praying? Does prayer even make a difference? Does God even hear me? 
Does God even care? You know, these are all reasons that we don't pray more. And I'm sure there's many other reasons. But today I want to talk about just one reason we don't pray more. It's a reason I haven't mentioned yet. Someone could come to me and say, Amy, I don't pray more because I just don't have time. I'm so busy. And I get it, we're all busy with different things, different responsibilities, different daily tasks. I am convinced that one of the curses on our nation, and I think it's devil-driven, is that Americans are so busy. It's like, it's just like we get absorbed with so many things. But I wanna show you something. In Luke chapter 11, and I think we're gonna look at Luke 11 next week. But in Luke chapter 11, one of the disciples is brave and he comes up to Jesus and he says this, he says, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And I don't know why this strikes me funny. Maybe it's because I'm the mother of four boys and there's a lot of competition in our house. But this phrase comes across a little snitty to me. Lord, John's disciples taught him to pray, but you haven't taught us. That's the way it comes across to me. Lord, teach us to pray like John's disciples, like John taught his disciples. But Jesus doesn't seem to react to that comparison. Let me say that again. Jesus doesn't react to the comparison. How often do we react to comparisons? Side point. Then Jesus says this. This is how you should pray. And then Jesus prays what has been traditionally labeled the Lord's Prayer. How many of you can quote the Lord's Prayer? Oh, come on. How many of you can quote the Lord's Prayer? Thank you. (laughs) And before I talk about my point with quoting the Lord's Prayer, let me just add this side note. I am convinced that Jesus' point with the Lord's Prayer was not to teach us to pray a repeated prayer, a rote prayer, just saying something specific over and over again. That's not what this is about. Instead, Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer as a model, an outline, a guide, a how-to guide. And I say this with confidence because the Bible is full of all kinds of different types of prayers. And if we were instructed to only say one type of prayer, why does the Bible include so many others? Fair enough, following my logic? The Psalms, for example, are full of prayers. Or the Apostle Paul, when he's writing, will suddenly break out into prayer. Like in Ephesians 1, he's writing about spiritual blessings, and then he just breaks out into prayer, and he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you would know the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? He breaks out into spontaneous prayer. But it's, it's, it's not the Lord's prayer. Or Jude. Jesus' brother, in his writings, he just suddenly starts praying. praying. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling and present us unstained before the presence of his glory. The Bible records all types of prayers. Jesus himself in Matthew 6, which is Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, don't pray a rote prayer right before the Lord's Prayer. Don't say repetitive words, Jesus says. That's not what the Lord's Prayer is about. So can we agree together, will you agree with me, that the Lord's Prayer is a model, okay? It's a how-to guide. It's an example for us. And with that in mind, I want to show you something, and I need a volunteer, and you're like, what do I have to do? But what I need is I need for somebody to grab their phone, their cell phone. Grab your phone and then pull up a stopwatch. Who can pull up a stopwatch on your phone? I need a stopwatch. Okay, CJ, you're it, okay? And this is what I want you to do. Get your stopwatch, and we're going to time something. Most of you told me that you can quote the Lord's Prayer, so we're going to say it together, and we're going to time it. So, CJ, when we say our, from our Father who art in heaven, we say our, you hit start. And when we say amen, you hit stop, okay? And you're going to record the time. You ready? So we're going to do this from uh, Matthew's gospel, because most of us know that version of it. We're going to do it from the King James, because most of us know that version. And we're going to say it together. And if you don't know it, I'm going to help you cheat, okay? And, and you can say it however you want to say it. Like, if you know a different version, you say your version. But CJ's going to time us, okay? Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. How long is it? 28 seconds. You guys are one second slower than first service and eight seconds slower than when I did this on my own. <laughs> but let that sink in. It was 28 seconds. And we all agreed together that the Lord's Prayer is a model, a how-to guide, an example of how to pray, right? So with that sinking in, one of the lies of the enemy that we tend to believe is that we don't have time to pray. I'm too busy today. And yet when Jesus gave us an example of the prayer, it was only 28 seconds long. Jesus taught us to pray a 28 second prayer. I mean, who can't find 28 seconds in their day, right? Everyone can find 28 seconds. Don't buy the enemy's lies that you don't have time. See, here's the thing. Jesus actually criticized the Pharisees who were known for their long prayers, for their long, drawn-out, repetitive, attention-seeking prayers. And please hear me on this. Jesus' point wasn't that we should avoid long prayers. His point was that we should avoid the misconception that prayers are only effective if they're long. Let me say that again. Jesus' point wasn't that we shouldn't pray long prayers. His point is that we should avoid the misconception that prayers are effective only if they're long. Now, I don't want you to walk away today thinking, I only have to pray 28 seconds a day. <laughs> That's not my point. Because if you look at the whole of Scripture, it says this of Jesus. One day soon afterwards, Jesus went up to the mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. That's more than 28 seconds. For me, it was only three and a half hours last night. <laughs> but eight hours, probably, he prayed. This is my point. The enemy can lie to us and tell us we don't have time to pray. But effective prayer can be as short as 28 seconds. And if you aren't praying at all right now, can you give God 28 seconds? Start somewhere. And build. See, I think the Lord's Prayer is intentionally short because God is just urging us to get started somewhere. It's a model. 28 seconds. You know, you can't run a marathon until you can run around the block. Praying all night is a marathon. Start at 28 seconds. If you pray half an hour... I'm urging you this Easter season, pray 35 minutes. Build. If you pray two minutes a day, pray five. If you pray 10, pray 13. Build your prayer life. Start somewhere. See, I'm convinced that the best way to prepare for Easter is to do what Jesus did. But let me say this. It's not just about Easter. The best way to prepare for life is to pray. Begin your day walking through prayer. Close your day praying. It doesn't have to be some long drawn out thing. It can be 28 seconds. But don't say anymore, I don't have time to pray. Do you know life has challenges? Life has daily challenges. Life has life altering challenges. How do you prepare for life's disappointments? How do you prepare for things in life that shock you and turn your world upside down? How do you prepare just for the monotony of life, for the times of crisis? You know, the thing that prepared me for leading this church after losing my dad was prayer. The thing that prepared me To face my life after losing a child and having two older sons and two younger sons and a big gap in the middle and always spending my life having to explain why that I lost a son, the thing that prepared me for that is prayer. 
one of my sons, and God willing, I'm going to talk about him next week. He was tough to raise. Oh, he was tough. <laughs> and you would not believe some of the things that we went through with him. And I'm not going to tell you, so you'll never know. <laughs> but just trust me. But he was so hard to raise. And I just I was like, God, have mercy on us. And I, I think I'm going to go into more detail of this next week. But he is now this, I'm talking about Josh. He is this. <laughs> He is this lovely, brilliant, amazing, godly man who is getting ready to move away. And it's like, for me, it's like, but God, I poured my prayer life into this kid. And now you're taking him away because he's moving to Ohio because Honda decided to hire him as an engineer. <laughs> but I'm losing my kid. How do I prepare for that? I pray. I pray. See, prayer is simply talking to God. It's about being real. It's telling him our fears. It's being still and knowing that he is God and, and listening to him. Can you take 28 seconds out of your day and just be still and know that he is God and listen? God, what do you want to say to me? Through prayer, we surrender our lives to him. We surrender our kids to him. Through prayer, we cast our burdens on him. Through, care, through prayer, we learn to trust him. We learn to know him. It's prayer that builds a relationship with him. Ken talked about this this morning, but he said there's all these prayer things going on. Why? Because there's no point of leading a church and doing church if we don't pray. Unless the Lord builds the house, they what? Labor in vain. I don't want to labor in vain without prayer. We can do nothing, Ken said this morning. And prayer is simply talking to God. Jesus prayed not just five times in the garden, but over and over and over again through his life, he prayed. How was he able to face the coming torture that he knew he was coming, the abandonment from everybody, including the Father God himself? How was he able to face the agony and the shame because he had immersed himself in the ways of God through prayer? And he taught us to pray using the Lord's prayer as our guide, showing us that everybody has time to pray. 28 seconds. So I want to close right now. Do you know probably one of the prayers that I pray the most? All the things that I pray, I almost pray this prayer the most. It kind of struck me. But I pray this, Lord, teach me to pray. I pray about my prayer life. Lord, teach me to pray. Teach me to pray according to your will. Teach me to pray effectively. Show me the balance between casting my cares on you and just being, expecting you to be my giant vending machine. Lord, teach me to pray. So as we begin this Easter season, would you work on your prayer life? Right now, as Sarah just plays for us and sings for us. Would you just take a moment and would you say, Lord, teach me to pray. And then would you just start talking to God like he's your best friend? Because if you make him that, he will be. Just talk to him. We don't need all these these and thys and thous and just, just talk to him like you would talk to the person sitting next to you at church. Better yet, talk to him like he knows everything about you because he does. Be real. Tell him your fears. He already knows, but it helps you. Tell him about your doubts. Tell him about your struggles. Tell him about the problems that just seem at times so overwhelming. Talk to him about your finances. Talk to him about your kids. Talk to him about your marriage. Talk to him about your boss. Talk to him about your pastor if you need to. Just talk to God. 28 seconds. Just, just, just you and God right now.
Yeah.